On April 26th, the British Royal Society issued a report on population reduction titled People and the Planet. The report states that 1.3 billion people must be brought out of extreme poverty on the basis of cutting global consumption and reducing global birth rates. Ultimately, they say, if this is not done effectively by 2050, the world will see economic and environmental failures on a scale never imagined. That same day, Paul Ehrlich, author of The Population Bomb and contributor to the report, decided to make their message even more explicit when he said to London's Guardian that the optimum population the Earth would allow in order to assure a decent life for everyone was 1.5 to 2 billion people. We have to humanely and as rapidly as possible move to population shrinkage, he said. This report comes at a timely moment, when the collapse of the economies of the Eurozone and transatlantic sector itself are upon us. That message of prevailing doom comes from the same quarters as those dying to save their decrepit system. This message of massive genocidal population reduction is part of a current offensive by the British crowd through all available channels. On May 7th, the Club of Rome, co-founded by commander of the British Empire, Alexander King, issued a report with nearly an identical message titled 2052, a global forecast for the next 40 years. The press release asks, how many people will the planet need to support? Which nations will prosper and which will suffer? Will the belief in endless growth crumble? Already one year ago, a similar offensive came out of Germany in the form of a report issued by the German Advisory Council on Climate Change, or the WBGU for short. The study titled A World in Transition, A Social Contract for Sustainability was led by yet another commander of the British Empire, Dr. Hans Joachim Schellenhuber, whose report calls for a rapid decarbonization of the world by 2050, excluding the use of nuclear power. Add to all of this, the report issued by the U.S. State Department in March, which stated that between now and 2040, global freshwater availability will not keep up with demand and will create regional tensions and promote acts of terrorism. They state this without putting forward any viable solution. These reports are not an actual indication of the prospects for the next 30 to 40 years. That 30-year investment cycle can actually mean the completion of projects like the North American Water and Power Alliance. But that requires the creation of an entirely new economic system. Furthermore, these reports contain the arguments that have been repeatedly proven wrong. In the 1970s, the study completed by MIT on behalf of the Club of Rome, titled Limits to Growth, created a model of unsustainable population growth that became a tool of massive psychological warfare which is still being used to this day. The limits to growth model is premised on the fixed system notion that industrialization means endless pollution and therefore inevitable collapse of civilization. However, after much criticism for not taking into account the advances in human technology, Meadows and Forrester of the MIT grouping recalibrated their model to include nuclear power. In this model, civilization still collapsed, However, this time not until farmland ran out. But these linear extrapolations are not an expression of how human progress has occurred or will occur, nor is there any interest from this grouping to actually conduct such an investigation. All such models will show a collapse, given that they omit all possible technological jumps based on discoveries of new universal principles. Human economic development expresses not a continual, unceasing growth within one system, but rather leaps from one enclosed system to a higher order system. Within the empire or environmentalist models, a closed system is maintained despite the increase in the baseline requirement of the system as a whole. When society does not keep up with this baseline, the consequences are devastating. This is addressed through increases in energy flux densities and technologies, not decreases as the environmentalists insist. 
By attempting to try to push back a collapse point by decreasing advancements and growth, society is actually pushed farther towards collapse. The series of studies produced by the LaRouche Pack Basement Team have more than proven the environmentalist approach to be wrong. The development of life on our planet is not only a quantitative increase in the number of species, there is also a qualitative increase, as prevailing forms of life have tended to the more energetic, which we mammals are the greatest expression of. The higher metabolism of mammalian life forms means that we consume more, but that consumption means a higher energy flux density. Mammals have a higher degree of freedom and mobility, in other words, a certain self-determination. They can still remain active when the sun isn't out, and can find food over a greater area of landmass, meaning a greater flow of material through the biosphere, or the biogenic migration of atoms. Those forms of life of a lesser energy flux density went extinct, as more energetic forms came into greater prominence. As seen in this graph, the green area represents the diversity of energy-dense species, while the gray represents the lesser energy-dense species over time. The red arrows point to extinction periods. Over time, we see that the more energy-dense species have become the greater percentage of life on this planet. Mammals depend on a higher rate of consumption, and also a higher complexity in the quality of consumption. This affected not only the mammals, but the organization and development of lower forms of life. Life on our planet has always tended towards such a dynamic and has never expressed itself as in a state of equilibrium. In fact, as the current policies of nations is an attempt to address a non-existent equilibrium state, it means the imposition of our own self-determined extinction. But why do governments and public opinion continue to persist in asserting that human society must reach an equilibrium? and that far-advanced, energy-dense technologies must be ruled out, while low-energy-dense technologies, such as solar, wind, and ethanol, must replace them. Why aren't we driving toward the more energy-dense sources of power, such as fusion and antimatter, and seeking the resources of the solar system, which are capable of supporting actual human growth? In 1981, Club of Rome founder Alexander King gave a revealing look at the thinking behind those who set the environmentalist agenda. In an interview with Executive Intelligence Review magazine, he described the objective of the club as much more than putting forward policies that governments would adopt. His idea was that the Club of Rome was to be five years ahead of governments, while only appearing to be two. As in his opinion, he said governments were not capable of acting quickly enough or responsibly enough. The bureaucracies of governments, even more than the ministers, are post facto mechanisms. They only react after events and do not foresee them. They are not prepared for them. While acting above governments, the Club of Rome set out to shape policy and opinion not directly, but by creating the environment where a population would desire that which it hates. We agreed very much that the Club of Rome would never try to seek a consensus agreement. The job was catalytic, to start debates. So many people in the club disliked the limits to growth. I personally think it was the best that could be done at the time. It had its faults, but it would have been difficult to better them. In acting as a catalyst, the Club of Rome prefers to wield power indirectly, leaving the appearance that student protests political destabilizations and economic austerity that it promotes are popping up spontaneously. Even they may not believe their own models and formulas, but the intended effect is something altogether outside any of the particulars. The environmentalist propaganda which was led by the Club of Rome in order to induce a massive shift in public opinion is now being pumped out into the public arena at an opportunistic moment. But given the falsity of the models and claims of the environmentalists, what emerges from under the heap of absurdities is the intended end result, the very rapid depopulation of the planet. 
What effect will such a message induce within a population? Other than that, they are already as good as dead, eliminating the belief that there is a mission for mankind worth fighting for. What effect will such a message have on a population which is threatened with world war, which would unleash the most terrible weapons created on Earth? The environmentalist movement is a culture of death and was only brought to prominence through the destruction of the culture of the United States and all nation states of the world. That message must be rejected. Let us make the next 30 years the start of a new renaissance for mankind. We need a new cultural outlook, one which we in the United States once held, where all life is sacred. This moment of crisis should not be the catalyst for lies that induce mankind to accept a hopeless fate. Rather, this must be the environment in which all the rules are broken, and we usher in a new economic system outside of the fixed limits imposed by an empire. We must rapidly move forward for the assurance of mankind's survival and continued growth on this planet. There are truly no limits.